Hi, can everybody hear me? Awesome. Uh, so just a quick show of hands, how many in the room have some sort of PM quality assurance process? And how many are utilizing some sort of PM checklists? Okay, great. So it looks like more people are utilizing PM checklists than a QA process. Um, so before we dive into talking about monitoring preventative maintenance quality, um, I'll just quickly talk a little bit about uh, preventative maintenance and the why. You know, we obviously uh, do PMs as a core responsibility of HTM to ensure the safety of our patients. Um, a quick example would be, you know, infusion pump sensors for flow rates and pressures. And if there's a degradation over time, preventative maintenance can be used to make sure that a malfunction in those sensors does not occur and uh, keep the patient safe. So it's really important that we are not only looking at preventative maintenance completion, but also preventative maintenance quality. Vizin2 has started this journey, um, and I really call it a high reliability journey. We're just at the start of it, so we will be covering some examples of what we've implemented um, here today. Um, a quick uh, introduction, um, Vizin2 is a New York and New Jersey healthcare system. It's nine facilities, and um, we have a service line that's consolidated with over 130 staff. Um, I've been in this role for five years, have 12 years of experience in HTM. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Price. Um, I'm the supervisor for the Finger Lakes VA. I've been doing that for about four years now. Um, started as entry-level tech in 2007, and just over the years kind of worked myself up into the VA as a supervisor. Um, some of the things I like to implement in my department are, we have a strong focus on KPIs and patient safety. So this uh, slide talks about preventative maintenance quality life cycle. So at the top, you start out with reviewing your service manual. And that's when you're going to identify the preventative maintenance manufacturer requirements, including the frequency and the PM tasks. Uh, in Prior to our uh, journey, we were looking at the service manual in one source, and we were identifying the frequency during the intake of the asset, and we were implementing some sort of PM schedule and maintenance definition in our new Novolo CMS. We've actually evolved, and now we actually document an intake. Um, this intake is evaluating what the OEM PM frequency should be. So we don't just program the PM schedule automatically in the CMMS. We have a CMMS admin that inputs in a field called OEM PM frequency what the frequency should be. So this allows us to do a mismatch report of what assets have the wrong OEM PM frequency. And we do document the uh, devices that do not have a frequency requirement. So we document that as a none. In some cases, manufacturers may not specify the periodicity. They might say periodic. In those cases, we will have a work group discussion and we will come up with what the standard for our organization should be. So we may uh, look at um, the cap requirements or um, you know, work order history to try to determine should we be doing triannual or annual in those cases where the manufacturer does not specify a frequency. So after that is inputted, um, we have our PM uh, work group that also reviews and determines the PM checklist. So this checklist is then implemented uh, into our CMMS. Um, so we use Novolo. We will come up with the trigger conditions. So depending on if the checklist was created with the equipment category in mind or if it's model specific, we will set those uh, trigger conditions. Um, after that time, uh, the PM, of course, uh, checklist is implemented. Um, we generate the PM checklist on the PM work orders automatically. And a subset of those PMs are also having QA work orders generate. 
So these QAs are reviewed by the manager to look for um, whether the service manual has been revised and basically evaluate whether the tasks, the documentation, and the PM sticker on the device are all aligning when they're uh, completing the QA resolution of pass or fail. So, you know, that immediately uh, can tell you that this is a, a complex life cycle. We, we have to kind of keep up with service manual revisions. Um, we also are trending the QAs to identify, you know, are there process issues? Are there um, training needs that need to be uh, addressed? And I also want to contextualize that in our world, our CMMS has limitations. The CMMS currently um, does not, not allow for us to have great uh, tracking of multiple preventative maintenance requirements. So what I mean by that is a manufacturer may have multiple recurrences. They might require a biannual battery reconditioning and a um, annual frequency for all the other tasks. Um, the way that we handle that in our organization is we have multiple maintenance definitions. So uh, two PM work orders will generate when the frequencies are aligning for that um, biannual and annual recurrence. So it's not a smart enough system to only generate one work order. And also the, cap the capabilities of the system do not allow for different PM checklists to generate based on the uh, tasks that have to be performed on those individual work orders. So um, of course there's going to be advancements with CMMSs that might uh, allow us to tackle those differently, but current case um, we are developing specific reports to track whether or not our PM um, conformance to those manufacturer requirements in the cases of multiple frequencies is being met. So that is not part of our overall department metric for OEM PM conformance. And I will be talking about the quality metrics it, um, on this slide. So these are just uh, ways that we came up with. These are brand new metrics within the last year that uh, we wanted to uh, move forward with. Now, I call them metrics. They can also be called measures. Um, it's really uh, more of a tr uh, baseline that you want to establish and see how you're doing over time. So the first one here is quality assurance fail percentage. So this is the number of QA fails divided by the overall QAs that are generated. So again, this will allow you to see, um, are you seeing an uptick or a decrease in um, the documentation issues that you're finding within your quality assurance work orders. Um, the next one here is OEM PM conformance. So this is our first way of looking at the true quality of whether or not we're PMing according to manufacturer requirements. So because we're documenting what the manufacturer requirement is in the CMMS, we can compare by model table whether or not we have devices that have the wrong PM frequency and whether or not there are devices with missing PM schedules. So both of those are added up and divided by the number of medical devices for which we have OEM PM decisions for. So this is the key. Obviously, we right now we're just at the beginning of this stage, um, most of our facilities are somewhere between 40 and 30% of the inventory having OEM decisions documented in the CMMS. So we definitely want to continue down the path of increasing that. We hope to be at 50% by the end of this fiscal year. Um, and we're prioritizing which categories we want to do decisions on. So we started off with high risk. Um, we moved on to imaging and lab, um, and we'll definitely, you know, continue to um, work on that. Another thing to remember is that um, we only care about whether we're following manufacturer's requirements for things that we are not doing AEM on. So any a devices on AEM are excluded from this conformance measure. This is great um, because we can holistically say to a department, 
oh, you're not meeting the 95% target for OEM PM performance. We would like you to come up with a plan to improve. Um, and it's, you know, a good way to, you know, again, making sure we're meeting a quality measure. And then there's more approaches to data hygiene, but something that we came up with is the percent of vendor PM work orders without service reports. Um, I talked about PM checklists, and we of course don't want to require manual documentation of the PM checklist if a vendor is performing the work because that would be uploaded as a service report instead. So we still wanna measure the quality of those PM work orders by having a way to count whether or not attachments for their service reports are uploaded on those vendor PMs. So talk a little bit about the measures. Um, I wanna talk about the big picture. What are our objectives? So we really want to make sure that we're doing PMs according to manufacturer requirements or our AEM. And in order to do all the measurement that I talked about, you know, you have to have processes and you have to establish some data. In order for even the PM checklist to trigger appropriately, you have to have a certain level of device naming conformance. Um, so we do require all of our facilities to make sure that they have named the model that we're implementing the PM checklist for accurately before we implement the PM checklist. Um, you know, we want to make sure everyone that is reviewing the PM QA work orders understands when it's appropriate to fail the QA work order. When we first started this, people really weren't failing things. They were, uh, you know, getting stuff corrected by kicking it back to the technician um, and teaching the te technician, but not quite documenting that that QA work order was a fail. So it was, it was limiting our ability to trend because people didn't understand that it was okay to fail a QA work order. And um, again, you know, teaching them when, what are those instances of when to fail? And, um, you know, what are the required PM tasks? So uh, we have a lot of field-based um, involvement in our work groups. So every facility has a lead representative for developing checklists and every facility has a lead representative for the OEM intake. So we have a lot of, uh, at least two members from every facility involved, and a lot of them are uh, supervisory BESs or uh, BMETs, and um, they, they are part of the process of developing the questions and uh, providing feedback um, and making it an iterative process. Um, at the beginning, I did talk about how uh, Service manuals update, and you do have to, you know, make sure that you're also establishing your frequency of review. Um, so we're still at the beginning stages of this. We don't have formalized frequency reviews, but our intake does allow for a facility to submit an edit request. Um, so we're, you know, still beholden to kind of um, uh, a root, gra grassroots approach where uh, when a a uh, technician would review one source and see that there are differences with now what the manufacturer is requiring, that they would alert their supervisor and the intake would be submitted. Um, if we find that we're not getting that through the grassroots approach and the QA is showing up as fail because there are variances in what we're requiring versus what the now manufacturer requires as a revision, um, we will have to take a look at our process and figure out how to make improvements on that. And then um, we also want to establish sustainment goals. So refining our documentation requirements by updating our SOPs. So I talked about our requirements for uploading service. That is um, a requirement in our SOP. Um, and then uh, there might be new requirements that we establish as uh, we're going along this journey so we can update our SOPs. A little bit more on the documentation requirements. Um, we really want to make sure that our technicians are um, documenting so that it's thorough enough. Um, 
obviously we are in in the beginning phases of our PM checklist. So there are plenty of work orders that do not trigger PM checklists. And so this is a good rule of thumb for our uh, managers that are performing the quality assurance. Is the documentation something that an entry level BMAT would be able to review and understand what was done? So that's kind of what we establish as the baseline for our documentation requirement. And then most importantly, the checklist is just providing structure. It's not meant to um, replace professional judgment. Um, we understand that even though we have representation in our work group from the field, um, you know, we might not get it right on the first try and we might need to iterate. So we are building a feedback mechanism to improve the checklist over time. So what are the benefits of a PM checklist? Um, it's, you know, human to error. So it's important to have some sort of cognitive aid to help with remembering the tasks that have to be performed. And that's really what um, the purpose of these checklists are. We wanna standardize how people are documenting, but also provide them with the cognitive aid we also like the automation. So if a question on the checklist is marked as fail, there are, there's an opportunity to document additional details or have a automation for corrective maintenance to generate to uh, do further work. And so ultimately, uh, we know that checklists are used in aviation and other industries and it leads to error reduction. So we wanna leverage that benefit. So some design considerations for checklists. Uh, there are two types of checklists. There's the do confirm checklist where um, you, know, you just perform all the tasks and you go back to the checklist and say, yep, I did all of this, check mark. Um, and then there's the read do where you're reading the task and performing it one at a time sequentially. Once we have mobile, we will be actually able to make this a read do write. So you kind of just like perform the task sequentially and document the values as you go. And of course, there's been demos here at the MD Expo that have shown information to documenting um, so you don't have to manually uh, document. And things to remember in terms of uh, considerations, um, you want to keep it brief. Um, we uh, hope that we can develop a checklist that are about five to nine items. Uh, this might not be possible because we do have to adhere to manufacturer requirements, um, but people really do like it if the checklists are brief. There, we need to uh, think about the clarity of what we're asking. Um, are there units in how we want to be documenting? Um, if we can specify an input type, true, false, um, it, it is really helpful. We, we try to do default um, responses as well to provide clarity there. Um, another uh, benefit would be uh, using, you know, readable forms. I think all the CMSs out there have different ways of doing it. So I'm just, you know, putting this out there. Um, wasn't really a challenge with our CMMS. Um, it, uh, and then the task types. Uh, you might want to uh, collect qualitative information, but again, being clear about what kind of information you want checked, cables or um, you know, visual damage. So giving some clarity on what you're uh, asking for is important. So there might be some challenges to the adoption of your checklist. Um, starting with resistance to change, um, people may perceive uh, checklists as an insult to their expertise. Um, and their autonomy. They might be worried about, is this an oversimplification? Um, and what you know, negative consequences could result? Uh, for poor checklist design, you know, there's, there's a lot that uh, can go into that. Um, basically, you wanna, you wanna make sure that your checklist, again, is brief and clear. There might be a lack of customization. Uh, in our CMS, 
there's a character limit of a uh, hundred characters. Um, what we found uh, is sometimes with a medical device incident investigation checklists, there wasn't enough uh, you know characters for people to document. So we were brainstorming how to you know tackle that challenge. Um, there might be needing to be training. So again, we don't have mobile, and we realized that some of our staff didn't realize that you can click a track mark and save, and you don't need to complete the full checklist and submit. That's a really important workflow thing that they needed to know is you don't have to complete everything at once. You can come back to it. Um, we actually ran into some checklist trigger errors. Um, in our workflow, we discovered if people were um, documenting the resolution code and going directly to pending documentation state, um, it was possible for the checklist to not trigger if it was not generating off of the work order type. So as we discovered these challenges, we were able to um, work around them, but just something to be cognizant of, um, you know, your CMMSs are all uh, built under certain assumptions and you may run into challenges. So this is some of the things that we did. Um, in order to increase the adoption of our PM checklist. Um, so I talked about resource allocation in terms of making sure we had leads identified in our work group for every facility. We um, really try to frame the checklist as a culture shift and a tool to help with the documentation. And again, having them, uh, the staff involved was key so that they got to make decisions about what the questions were. Um, we had really clear communication too. We set up office hours. Um, so before um, a checklist was deployed, we would send out an email and we would the very next day have office hours so that anyone that had questions could get their questions addressed. Um, and then we would have a follow up um, office hours as well to make sure um, if new uh, questions were coming up, we were addressing them. Um, you know, uh, it talks about uh, feedback and improvement here. Um, so the periodic review. Um, so we have a work group lead. That's uh, one of our strategic goals for this year is to set up touch points with the individual facilities with regards to the PM checklist and asking them, you know, exactly how is it going? Is there anything you would like to change? Um, you know, I think we've all had surveys sent out by our organizations that we don't get involved with, and this is why we really wanted to give that focused attention and set up these touch points so that we really did invite the time to gather feedback on this um, because we know that this is important um, to high reliability and um, we want to make sure you know we're not just sending a survey that we won't really connect with everybody. So I'll hand it over to Mike. Thank you. Everyone hear me? Good. All right, so we're going to jump into PM quality assurance. Um, currently, two percent of our PM work orders generate a PM quality assurance work order. So some of the questions on the quality assurance work order. Are, are asking label updated and visible, um, case cleanliness, old label removed, um, appropriate documented procedures, is the current frequency correct that matches with OEM or AEM, um, just making sure resolution details are documented appropriately and thorough. Um, if the device is networked, we have a checkbox in our CMMS um, that, that is checked appropriately. And then also if networked, SMACs enabled and vulnerabilities are patched. And also if networked, AV installed and patched. So some process improvements resulting from our PM quality assurance work orders. Um, these are things we found or just kind of picked up on here. Um, vendor service reports missing or vendor work documentation. Um, we found some that are missing procedure steps. Uh, assist inspections not attached, expired PM stickers, mismatched vendor and PM stickers, 
Um, this was a kind of a big one that we've seen a lot in Finger Lakes here. This next one, Mis mismatch vendor PM month to maintenance definition month in CMMS. A lot of times we'll see this with equipment on contract where the vendor will come in a certain month and our schedule is different in our CMMS. So a lot of times that will result in a phone call to the to the vendor to make sure we're we're both aligned. Either they they change or we change our our month that we start in. Um, the missing parts, pricing for PM kits and inventory naming issue. We threw some examples in here. This is directly from Finger Lakes work orders. Um, this is just an example of what like we would consider a, a successful P QAPM. Um, this one, I've expanded the pictures. You can see in ours, the tech has um, attached pictures. So these are the pictures blown up. Basically just showing our our Biomet sticker, our asset tag sticker, and then a full view of kind of like where those are located on the equipment. Um, this one, we're, we're also double checking to make sure our next schedule maintenance date is correct. Which is down in this area here. And then down here, you'll see checklist items have been completed. So we would consider this a past uh, QAPM. So going back, this would be, this is just showing a, an actual PM that the tech has done. And so we're doing the QAs, we, re, we refer back to the original PM. So when we get into here, we're looking for up here, this is, uh, this is an example of a, a CT machine PM. So we can see the service report is attached up top up here. Um, the technician has their time documented and vendor time down here. Um, we've also checked our next scheduled maintenance date to make sure that's correct. So this will be, this will also be a pass. So we'll switch over to some improper PM documentation. So this one was caught on a portable x-ray PM um, on the QA work order. Uh, we realized that there was no service reports attached to the top up here. And then we also look to see if the tech has put anything in the notes as to why there is no uh, service report attached. So there was nothing in the documentation here or anything attached. So this was failed and sent back to the technician to um, to get the service reports. Um, here's an example of one of the checklists we've imp implemented so far in Finger Lakes. Uh, this is for a C800 overhead um, lift. Uh, the checklist was built off the manufacturer specs. Um, this is a NCPS the National Center of Patient Safety Requirement. So in the past, we haven't been attaching our form to, to work orders. Um, so this kind of makes it easy that this is built right into the work order so we can't bypass it and everything in there is, uh, all the requirements are in there while doing the PM. Uh, as a result, our, P, our documentation time has gone down. You know, we're not scanning, scanning PDFs into the work orders. Um, Another nice thing about this is if you do fail something, it will prompt you for an elaboration on why it failed. You can put your notes in there. So this has been working well for Finger Lakes. Um, here's another checklist example. Uh, this is for a centrifuge. This is for a an Allegra X12, I believe it was. Um, so we've just started implementing this for our centrifuges. This is nice. It's looking for expected time, expected time in seconds, and then your actual value, and then your expected speed tolerance, and then your actual speed results, and then your, your final pass or fail value. Um, this is required documentation for um, blood bank centrifuges per AABB. And again, this just ensures that the requirement is being met by the technician, make sure we're uh, not out of compliance here. And then again with this one, if anything is marked failed or is out of spec, it will elaborate. You'll have to elaborate um, as to why it failed. Um, so this is what the checklist looks like in our CMMS for a QAPM. Um, so basically all the things I've already went over here, uh, label updated, label visible, case cleanliness. So there's a whole multitude of um, of questions here that we have to answer. Sure. This is only created on percentage of 
two percent two percent of our pm work orders yet i think when we first started our lean what it was a hundred percent um was so yeah we uh no it was two percent um but it was hundred percent for incoming inspections right. oh. uh so we actually did custom development with Nivolo in order to build this QA workflow. Um, it does automatically assign to your um, manager of the uh, assignment group. So that's kind of how it works. Um, it's uh, it's nice that uh, it's a separate work order um, and there is a parent-child relationship. So you're not allowed to close this work order uh, without uh, moving the child work order, which it was generated off of, which is the original PM work order, until that's been moved to closed. So the manager is typically the person assigned to do the QA review. Yeah, so uh, in some facilities, they do delegate it to a biomedical engineer, but it's typically either a supervisory best or the chief of the department. All right, so here is a, um, here's a picture of our RO, RO unit, and this was found on a PMQA that the, our equipment category here was incorrect. So the equipment category on this RO unit is a sterilizer unit, STEAM, which is not correct. So this was a good one because this is important as far as if we're using OEM uh, frequency on per PMs, if we have something in there for a sterilizer that's maybe due quarterly and maybe the RO unit is due annually, um, we're gonna be off or vice versa even when we're missing PMs. So this was a good catch. Um, yes. Yep, it would. So you can generate a work order. So in our case, we would fail the QA. It would come back to the. It would come back to the tech. At the VA, we don't do anything with our our asset stickers, so that'll go to logistics. But yeah, so we would fail the PM. The the tech would be notified to make the corrections that are needed. Um, so here's another one. This was found on a. PMQA, this is a ultrasonic cleaner, an SPS. Um, this one was kind of a unique situation. Um, the vendor came in and completed a PM. Uh, the tech happened to be off that day, so typically he'll he'll be with the vendor or come in after and put our sticker on it, make sure everything's good. Um, that day he was off, so this was a good catch as well. We probably never would have found this until the year after um, that we were missing a PM sticker. So, you know, I just want to continue to uh, talk about, is it, you have to keep to evaluating your process and ask, you know, is, is this still matching what the needs of the organization are? Uh, so right now, you know, we're loving the PM checklist. Um, we are also looking at products, um, you know, such as the Prompt Mobilize and um, different vendors to see if there are elements of our process that can be automated. Uh, so that's really the take home message from this slide is um, you wanna look at your checklists and inspections and ask, you know, are they being managed? Are they being um, um, executed according to your organization's wishes? So we do have reports that we look at to see how many fails we captured for certain pass fail inputs on the checklist. Um, we are evaluating the use of the checklist. Um, for example, initially our incoming inspection checklist um, was triggering off of the problem cause. So there was a different checklist for loaner incomings versus um, regular uh, equipment that you know we own in the facility. What we found was that people weren't paying close enough attention when um, they were filling out the question on the checklist about uh, the next maintenance date for a loaner work order. So 
you know, we've really had to redesign that checklist for an incoming workflow. Um, kind of the same applies. You, you do have to audit what values you're collecting from your checklist. And this is elaborating on the bypass issue that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, we, like I said, we do have reports that are broken out by month and look at the things that are pending or completed um, to see if there are any process issues that we need to address. Um, we did set up a monitor to determine if our checklist did not trigger um, to manage this uh, workflow issue that we found. And we educated our staff during office hours about what we expected them to do. Um, so there, we have submitted intakes into our operations and maintenance contract to help us um, find a permanent solution as well. So that concludes our presentation and we'll take any questions that you guys have.